actually welcome to the second keynote lecture. Uh, when Ben asked me to introduce Daniel Johnson, our, our keynote speaker tonight, um, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was. Um, I was wondering why he had asked me. He doesn't really know, uh, but it was fortuitous. I, when I was a, a bachelor design major in Florida, in Gainesville, in the University of Florida, I took some uh, ceramics courses in 1989, 19, uh, sorry, 1989, 1990, I think, two courses, one wheel flowing, one uh, hand building course. And so I have an affinity for ceramics because at the time these were summer courses, and as you know, Florida, North Central Florida, in the summer is very hot. Plus, you run in kilns. We did, we had a wood fire kiln. We had gas kilns. It was sort of hell on earth. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't let that, that, that be mistaken with that because hell on earth making beautiful things is quite pleasurable. Mm -hmm. So even though it was very very hot near the kilns. What came out of them, uh, and I'm not talking about my work right now, but the work of the other students, because I was also overseeing the, the ceramic store, was quite amazing. And this transformation from dirt into art that you can track as a, as a potter is fascinating. The other thing, and if I put this image up, it's actually still from a movie that Daniel will show in a moment. Uh, this is a still from a movie that talks about his work and describes what he's doing shows you sort of the pose of somebody who is really in his métier, right? Who is sort of in the moment of working on something. Probably not thinking a lot, but feeling and understanding, being one with what he's making in this, in this moment. I don't really know whether that's true or not. You may have been, you know, listening to what, not God knows what, and thinking God knows what, but I'm reading that into this sort of image right now. And I, I, I remember when I was doing wheel throwing and getting past that point where you you lose your fear of putting your hand in the, in the clay mm -hmm. and then this magical moment where you can pull things up and make space out of a solid fascinating so I don't know if you whoever has done it you know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. so it was really pleasure for me to be able to introduce the idea tonight and I, I want to give you sort of a few highlights that I found, of course, online when we when I had connection here. <laughs> so the, the few things that I found that I, I thought I need to mention, and Bennett asked me not to just sort of read you know, his his uh, his uh, CV. So I'm just give you two sentences, okay, three maybe. So he um, was hired as a production thrower by Cole Potter in Seagrove when he was 16. He apprenticed with Mark Hewitt between ages 18 to 22, so for four years, five, four or five years. And then spent time in England uh, working with Clive Bone and Sven Bayer. Uh, all three are part of that uh, Michael Cardew lineage. And he also studied in Thailand, making uh, large water jars. And I think that's sort of what the movie is about, I think you make large jars and then I get, get exhibited while also sold, right? So your production, you really make your living doing pottery. So, that's really all I have. I want to ask you to help me welcome Daniel Johnson. So 
yeah, so Ben asked me last summer, but I also thought maybe we were both drunk and he didn't mean it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for the email to come. I told you I But it was so slow the way you said it. You know? <laughs> really about um, how this scared boy uh, sort of turned into this very vulnerable man. <laughs> um, so I wanted to be an architect, uh, so I quit school at 16 and built this barn. Um, and um, I tore down an old house and decided to, that was the first way for me to figure out architecture. Uh, I grew up as a sharecropper, uh, taking care of other people's land. Um, uh, my father was fought in Vietnam, and we sort of got all the advantages of what Vietnam does to people. So at 16 years old, I uh, bought uh, 10 acres of land and built a shack and moved out on my home. And started to work with this lady, Nilco Graves. She was in her 70s whenever I was under the tutelage of her. And, um, I would work two years with her. Uh, I would make 30,000 pots a year. So by the time I was 18, I had already made uh, 60,000 pots. That's when I went, uh, went, that's when I met uh, British potter Mark Hewitt. And uh, I started to think about pots differently. Uh, I could make them really well, but I wanted to think about them. I knew they had, they had deeper meanings than just throwing production. So I met Mark, and he was making these large jars, and I was really fascinated. Um, of what he was doing, and so I accepted an apprenticeship with him. And I worked two years there before I did the first bit of traveling, and I traveled to England. This is North Devon, so I had the luxury of some of my most formative years being sort of trained by some of the most sophisticated uh, folks in England. Like y'all know, familiar with, North, uh, with Cornwall, uh, North Devon is such a phenomenal place. Bob Owen. He's part of the lineage, the various particular pedigree that I'm from, uh, that dates back to uh, Leach and Hamada uh, studies the sort of brought the uh, Eastern ideas of ceramics to the West uh, and fought the Cultural Revolution in doing so. And so um, Bob Bowen embodies that tradition completely. He's a trained painter uh, turned potter. This is a little town not far from where I trained called Clovelli. Uh, this is the first time that I understood material in architecture. I started to begin to understand after having lived in the American South, where there's a lot of vinyl siding and a lot of single lots, I really understood material when it came to architecture um, and the sort of honesty of the place, the way the buildings are built, and what they're built out of. When I returned to Marx, for another two years of my apprenticeship after training in England, and I started to be really interested in large jars. And I think the reason for that is is that I'm really interested in the space they take up. And <laughs> so a version of architecture. They control as much of the space outside of them as they do inside of them. Um, so I was really poor. <laughs> And I will indulge quite a lot about myself, uh, and I don't mind that at all. Um, but I wanted to learn to make large jars, and the best place to do that was in Southeast Asia. It's the only place really that there's a large jar culture left. Um, and so I wanted to go to Southeast Asia to work. Um, but I didn't have the money to do that. I had land and, and responsibilities. So uh, a friend of mine who's a designer designed this sculpture for uh, Park Penny Stadium in New York football fans. Uh, at NC State. This is a 22 foot sculpture. Um, and he asked me if I knew how to weld. Uh, not knowing how to weld, I told him I did. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me that it would pay $400 a day for me to weld the substructure for the sculpture if I could weld it. And so I went out and bought a welder, and within a couple of days I had taught myself how to weld enough to weld the substructure. So this is made out of concrete, but there's a Every six inches, there's a piece of metal underneath that that builds the entire form. I was given a 24-inch model uh, to build a 22-inch sculpture, which seems to be the real um, <laughs> kicker when it comes to <laughs> um, yeah, models. Um, so 
Uh, I did this, I finished this uh, on New Year's Eve, and two days later I was in Thailand. <coughs> <coughs> this is where I truly started to understand material and architecture. Um, I really fell in love with these buildings. Um, so for me, this is the highlight of architecture. It's the most beautiful building I've ever seen. I used to sit every day and watch the sun go down and think about, I tried to figure out what was wrong with the building, I tried to figure out what was right, and I couldn't come up with an answer on either way. <laughs> and so I concluded that it was the best I'd seen. <laughs> this was the building that I worked in. Uh, we made 10 pots a day in teams of two. So uh, one person rolled coils and the other person uh, coiled the pots and spun the wheels. So my job was to spin the wheel. This is Mr. Cow, my teacher there. These are the jars. The jar to your uh, left is a, uh, it's called a Pladette jar. It's a fish paste jar. It's a jar to make fish paste. The jars to your right are uh, mortars. Uh, so fish paste is made with a third salt, a third fish, a third uh, rice husk. That's put into the jar and sealed. There's a double rim, so it can be sealed. It's fermented for about six months. You pull, you open it up after six months, the water that's come to the top of the surface is what you know is fish sauce. You seal it back up and for two to three years it will sit and ferment until the fish has broken down and it becomes the sort of protein and all the minerals that they, they get in their diet. This is just a drawing that I did when I was there. This is to show you that people think of traditional pots or sort of the word folk pots as being unsophisticated and this is to show you that they're not. Um, this is the way the pots would, it's gone dead, I'm afraid. This is to show you how the pots would um, be stacked in the kiln. The pots have to be strong enough to be able to lift them down to the next one with a stick. This bottom pot here, this pot has to hold up 250 pounds at a temperature of 2400 degrees for five days. So if that pot is not made properly, then that pot will collapse during the firing and, and wreck you know, hundreds of dollars worth of work. But it's to show you how sophisticated these pots are. Everything is measured, everything is known about these pots. So whenever you see this and you think they're unsophisticated, I'll do this one. All right. I'm just going to start all that over. I took a lot of pictures of pots in groups like this, and for a longest time I didn't understand why I was get this feeling whenever I see this. And um, it, it took me several years after seeing it that I, I started to understand it. I have five nieces and nephews, and uh, I've been there shortly after they were born. And I recognize that the same feeling happens when I go into the hospital room with them. And it's uh, potential, and it's pure potential. The story of these jars haven't been told yet. So they're fresh. Some of them won't make it through the kiln. Some of them will only make it a few years before they're broken. Some of them will become sort of family heirlooms. Some of them will end up in museums. Most of them will be forgotten about. And that's what I felt whenever I looked at this. This is a kiln they're fired in. Um, this kiln is 18 feet wide, uh, 36 feet long, and 10 feet tall. It's one of the most beautiful structures I've ever seen. It's all made out of all handmade brick. And no form, no math. They just built them the same way as sort of, uh, I don't know if you guys know what mud daubers are. Yeah, they're built in the exact same mentality as a mud dauber, spit some mud on top of each other. This is the conclusion of the firing. This is my land in North Carolina, on 10 acres. It sits upon a knoll. Uh, when I returned from Thailand, I was like, this, I suffered a severe <laughs> culture shock. Um, but the sort of great thing about being really poor is that you don't have the opportunity to uh, participate in those endeavors. So I started to build my pottery using sort of a structural mentality that I had seen in, in Thailand and England. So I'm trying to pay uh, to be honest with the materials that I had in the landscape. 
This is one of the most important buildings in my life. This is a tobacco farm in the south. I worked in tobacco farms as a youth. At age five, seven, that age range, I started working in tobacco farms. They kind of hired the young kids to hang all the tobacco, um, which is also why I can smoke three packs of cigarettes in a day and not blink. <laughs> um, although it's been a year since I've had a smoke, so. Uh, but this structure is the most beautiful in that um, they're usually built from um, non-architects, non-builders. They're built by farmers. Um, and they're built on a 16 by 16 foot um, uh, grid, which is a really fantastic proportions. So this is the studio that I built. And this is built uh, 16 by 32. So it's as if two of those were put together. Um, I cut all the timber for this, sawed all the wood. The structure uh, cost me $2,000. All the windows are refab, or re rehab windows. All the bricks are recycled. It's just a roof that costs me money. This is the kiln and the kiln shed and the pottery. This is what it looks like now. Um, I was really interested, the reason I spent so much time building this is I, was, I really believe completely that what comes out of us has come into us at some point. And so I think that um, our subconscious is a very powerful thing, but I think we're left in control of our subconscious <laughs> before it becomes our subconscious, you know? So, uh, I wanted to, the place that I worked, I wanted to be in this space that held me to a standard. Uh, I wanted the richness of the wood, I wanted the richness of the dirt floor. Uh, I wanted to have to compare my work to that constantly visually. This is the video. Uh, that I want to show you is just about a four minute video, but this shows you how I make the pots and it gives you a much better idea of the studio. So I'll just uh, play this for you. And this was shot by uh, this is a friend of mine, but also the great grandson of uh, uh, Henry Matisse.
about 10 or 12 to 20 at a time, the large jars. Um, and every, that's about how many it would fill my kiln up. And so then I would make pots, fill the kiln up, um, and then fire it, and then try to sell them. So, uh, but the funny thing that happened is that after the 15th or 20th pot, then I started to like get into this place in my head. And I, I wanted to keep going. And I realized that like, that's where I, where I had like started to really learn something. And so I thought, what, what fantastic thing would it be if I just kept going instead of stopped here, you know? So I thought, why don't I just make a hundred of these and see what happens? And so I set out and uh, wanted to make a hundred jars. And I had these crazy ideas and no way to pay for them. So I just decided that I would make a hundred jars and I would sell them for $450 a piece. And the sort of deal that I made with myself is that I would give everything I had to every single jar. And I wouldn't feel beholding to the customer because I'm selling it for such a cheap price. Mm -hmm. So I would make a lot of ugly jars and I'd make a lot of beautiful ones and I'd make a lot of weird ones, but it was my sort of my time to do that. So I was making jars at such a rate that I would have to dry them on their side, uh, let the bonds dry up in the sun. And the project taught me that evolution is not progression. If you want to experience evolution, then you have to be present. Present is the only time you'll ever experience evolution, is when you're present. And this taught me about, I expected my first jar to be okay, and I expected my last jar to be phenomenal. And it's not what happened. <laughs> All that those jars did was give me a record of my life in that time period. So on the last day of the project, I made 10 jars in one day. <laughs> this is the jars lined up, and this is a point in which the, uh, my career really shifted. I started to, I lined these jars up, I hadn't had time to really look at them. This is all 100 jars lined up in a row. And I had about a three hour time period to look at the jars before the customers were in line to buy them. <laughs> and what I realized is I recognized the shadows were all the same coming off the jars. I recognized the angle. I recognized how I placed them. What I recognized is that I had created a sort of installation in my yard. And um, at that point I realized the sort of transformation to make my work so sort of culturally relevant this time period. This is a lot of customers. Wow. <laughs> um, in 17 minutes, I uh, sold uh, 100 jars and took orders for 100 more. <laughs> so I went from being $20,000 in debt to making $90,000 in 17 minutes. <laughs> it's the most bizarre feeling you can have. <laughs> a uh, fantastic moment in my life um, after quitting school and carrying around a lot of guilt about that and a lot of insecurities and um, the day that I was, went to Eastern uh, Michigan campus and become a, a professor for a semester was uh, really gratifying. I was uh, the honorary scholar there for uh, the art department and I uh, talked to all, uh, started a program talking to all the art students about how to Manifest your work sort of in capitalism in this sort of this capitalistic world we live in, for better or worse. Uh, teaching is a big part of my life. Uh, these are my I have an apprenticeship program. These are my these were my apprentices. The summer this was taken, um, I used to have from you know two to three or four apprentices. Uh, they work with me for a couple of years at a time. This is my first kiln. This is about 900 cubic feet, about the size of the school bus. Uh, after I had um, made pots for about 10 years, the big pot project was finished. Um, I realized that I had become sort of bored with the work that I had made, and I didn't understand why I was getting more and more depressed. Um, and Thought, the longer I thought about it, the more I realized that I had figured out how to fire my kiln. I had figured out the plate that I was using. I had figured out what my life was doing at the moment. 
And so the only way I could figure out how to fix that, you know, I, I just realized that like what I, I made me happy was figuring all of that out. And so the only way I could fix that is to get rid of what I had. And so I tore down my old kiln and destroyed it and decided I would build another one. But I didn't have the money to do that, so I sent a letter to all my customers asking, telling them what had happened and what I wanted to do. And I told them I was going to make these pictures and I would sell them for $200 a piece as a sort of as a marker between the shift in my career. And in two weeks' time, I sold these pictures for $200 a piece. I had sold uh, 200 of them, raising $40,000 to build a new kiln. This was the destruction of the old kiln. This is the picture of the new kiln. There's a bit of me that has to confess that I really just wanted to build something that looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew it cost $40,000 to have the nice and build. <laughs> So this is an interesting picture because this is me trying my hardest to fit in this culture. But these two pictures are very telling because you can't sort of change the glaze on a jar and sort of become culturally relevant. And you can't sort of reinvent the jar, the shape of the jar, and become culturally relevant. Um, so it's sort of my time as a professor, I actually spent most of my time in the library. Uh, thinking, which I think is the most phenomenal thing that colleges offer people is the time to think, you know. Um, somebody's going to get a hold of me, sorry. <laughs> so this picture is uh, important because it's uh, from Lucian Floyd, one of my, is my most favorite painters. He painted paintings this way whenever it wasn't very cool to do so, and he stuck to this tradition. And I really love his work. I share a lot of similar mentality as him. This piece is also really important to me. Um, this is sort of whenever we started to look with our minds or our eyes. So this is my fountain. Um, so this jar is really important. I thought about it a lot in context of the fountain. So there is no jar that looks this way in history. But people think that they, they recognize it's from either North Carolina or from, from Southeast Asia. But the reason they do is because it's an, archi it's, it's an archetype. It's archetypical of those ideas. There are no jars in North Carolina that have ash runs that much. There are no jars in Thailand that have finials like that. We think they have finials like that because you've seen, you've seen buildings with finials like that. You've seen tiny jars with finials like that. But you've not seen more jars like this side. So I put all of that together and put it in a jar. This jar tells you a lot about, this jar makes you believe you're seeing something. This is a whole line of archetypical jars. Um, I look at a lot of inside of buildings, a lot of inside of barns. Um, I grew up in barns and the uh, I uh, begin to recognize that you can tell a lot by the person who built them and the person who took care of them and what their character was. You know, unfortunately, a lot of the buildings I look at, there was not an architect involved. But <laughs> um, I love this barn, the way that it's got a new roof, but they could give a shit about the doors. <laughs> but those sort of like those little things are so telling about the farmer's character. You know? yeah. And some barns you'll find the most beautiful rock foundation with that old leaky roof, and it speaks to that person's character. It speaks to who, what they believe is important, you know. And so looking inside of these things are really profound to me. Um, I sort of start to realize that. You know, these buildings, they've been objective, you know, they're just objects, and we call them sort of home, we call them work, but they're, they're these objects. You know? We assign the meaning to them. Um, the first time um, I built a house, when I was uh, 23 or four, it was the first proper house I built, and I laid the foundation, 
And um, I laid the first uh, seal board on the foundation. And it's like great hollowness that filled me then. And it was because I realized that at that moment, that sort of the concept had become reality and the decaying process had begun. So it's death was marked. Um, and that was uh, proven to me even stronger a few years later whenever my uh, partner would be taken uh, from me with cancer. So I began to understand sort of what the shortness of life. And I spent a decent amount of time drinking bourbon. Um, and thinking about the home that I built and what it meant without anyone in it. And then I started thinking about structures that we have and what it means for us um, to walk through them. And I find that um, the most beautiful thing you can experience is a building to be To experience a building when it's being used for what it was built for. And so my studio, I find it most pleasant whenever it's full of pots. It's built to hold pots. So it is at its best when it's doing so. If you guys want a really wild experience, then you should smoke a joint and go to Walmart at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> It's the most phenomenal architectural experience you have ever had. <laughs> to experience a piece of architecture that grand without the people in it is phenomenal. Yeah. It is a very spooky spiritual feeling <laughs> to see the emptiness of a building that was designed to hold hundreds of people. You know, and um, it's a very powerful thing. So, uh, this was what I saw when I was a child. Light coming through. It sort of gets into your subconscious. And the sort of idea of the sort of birth of these jars and them being together before they go off into the world, before their lives are all told in different ways, different lengths. And this is then put together in installation. This is my um, first installation I did in Greensboro. And this is just me putting the barns that I've seen when I was a child together with all the work and training as a potter I've done. This was the gallery space. This is when I had to start figuring out about working with other architects and what they had done before me, which is not I don't really enjoy, to be honest. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is working with this sort of uh, structure that exists already. So this piece started because of the great sort of debate between art and craft. And a good friend of mine started a uh, debate with a, a major art critic about what art and craft was and what ceramics was, was craft or art. And I strongly believe that ceramics is craft. And I, unfortunately, most of the potters that I know would sort of, they would, you know, they would chain me up to a post if they heard me say that. But I strongly believe that ceramics is craft or pottery is craft. So if you have this jar sitting in the foreground here on a pedestal in a white, in a white box, then that's being presented as craft in a museum. But I believe there's like great beauty in it. So my concept was I built a 75 foot tunnel. I made 31 jars, all exactly the same. I took 30 of the jars and I put them uh, abnormally high within the tunnel, which had to walk through the tunnel to get to the last, the first jar, or the, or the 31st jar, in a sort of white box that represented the museum space on a pedestal. And the beauty of it is, the pot on the pedestal is craft. Unmistakably, the other 30 pots within the installation is art. So within 75 feet, you go through and experience the same object as art 
and as Pratt. And it was my answer to both friends of the debate. But what came out of that, this is a really funny little time lapse I'll just show you really quickly. But what came of that is uh, a further sort of sophistication of the idea of these uh, installations. This is important because when I build these installations, um, I only museums or galleries can only be shut down for a very small amount of time. So everything has to be pre-engineered. So we only have a week, usually max, to build an installation. So everything has to be pre-cut, pre-everything, pre and brought in a huge group of people and then put together. And there's no room for error because, like I say, you only have four or five days before opening day. Um, and so this just shows you the sort of insanity of what um, how this all goes together. That installation made me start thinking about the way that you see and light. This is um, part of my second installation. Mm. This installation was sort of a created this very um, spiritual place inside that mm. become these objects that you usually go to a museum to sort of view, then you, they become the sort of people, they become the things that viewed you. you. You went into the center of them. They are all surrounded you. And the light was coming from the center. So every time you saw something that you wanted to see, then you would look closer and then you would block the light. So in essence, the sort of closer you looked, the less you could see. These are wood-fired bricks, or oil-fired bricks from down south. I've always loved this. And it was an, the inspiration for this installation. This is 12 feet tall. And this is painted wood and then burnt. stories of big pots, there were three sections of big pots. The light was really keen on, and the pots were pixelated with dots. There's 25,000 dots on each pot. This is my current project that I'm working on. This is uh, installation 906, 955, um, the huge projects at the Sun Bay. And that's actually opening up into in two weeks. Yeah. So um, this is a project that I sort of conceived of after I left Haystack last year. And so as you enter the tunnel, uh, you start off with a black or a white pot. And as you walk around through the tunnel, the very center is neutral. So it's 50% white dots and 50% black dots. It's also the most dimly lit part of it, and then as you escape throughout the other side of the tunnel, the tunnels, the, the pots become lighter or darker. What happens is the speed of the turn, though, is you're unable to detect the change of tone, so 
you enter the tunnel looking at black pots, but you exit the tunnel looking at white pots. So you end up at a place that you don't understand how you got there. Uh -huh. This is the prefab. This is the pre-cutting wood a couple of weeks ago. This is the ceiling from one side of it. <coughs> This is one of the jars, this is almost four foot tall. This is one of the neutral jars, this is 50% white dots and 50% black dots. This is the wood. Uh, part of the wood is burnt black to meet the black side and the other part of the wood is white washed, proper, proper white wash instead of uh, paint. So you can see the transformation of color. You can sort of see the gradation of color start and to move up to the white. Uh, this is a sort of an odd project that got stuck in here because um, I started to think about a uh, fence post. Um, and this is a large jar I made for a, a sculpture garden. This is really mostly about the surface. This is uh, made on site and then fired. So we're building the kiln around it here. This is why the kiln's being fired. This is it in the garden. This is about 10 feet tall. This is a um, Really important to me as a child, these were uh, stone fence posts, and I saw these for the first time out in Kansas, and I really love the uh, quality of them. And I found them very haunting. And I did never, you know, as a child, you just sort of like uh, mesmerized by things, but now I've like looked back and I think about it, and I like wonder why they're so haunting these fence posts, and why they are is that at some point these fence posts they were barbed wire in between them. And they kept the in in and they kept the out out, you know. But the problem is with these fence posts is they outlast the fence. So you end up with this dotted line that suggests a fence, but the in is not in anymore and the out's not out anymore. So now you have the in and the out coming together. But it's just this like sort of slight shadow of space that represented an area to where at some point that didn't happen. And as I was working on the project for Peter's projects, um, this 50 large jars is a lot, of, a lot of energy. I started to, um, I got really depressed and I spent uh, several weeks um, in bed, if I'm honest. And um, it's what happens when I start thinking really hard about everything. And then when I came out of it, I realized that um, I needed to start making some work that was not look like that perfect jar, you know, that wasn't an archetype. And then I thought about who makes the pots that I really love. And the, the surface qualities of the pots that I really love are made by two kinds of people. One is someone who's made pots for so long that they sort of unconsciously handle the material and it's beautifully unconscious or people who's never made pots at all and the way they make pots. And it's made the exact same way with that same unconscious nature. So what did I think? I thought, okay, I got it. I got all these students here. I just had to make big pots. So I just stopped <laughs> making big pots and I had them start making them. So this is them making big pots for the first time. And I stopped uh, assigning an ego to them. So we assign them studio, so everybody shifts pots, so nobody finishes one pot. Everybody moves from one pot to the other, so you remove the ego. Why that's important is because with these installations, I need building blocks. I don't need 50 egos, you know? I need 50 pieces of wood, I need 50 bricks, I need 50 beautiful objects, I don't need 50 egos. So we started a studio, we started Stampin' Studio, this is the fire. The beauty of this is I've been like barking at like 
museum stores for my whole career, wanting them to pay attention to my pots. <laughs> and um, I've made 960 some pots in my career and sold them, 960 huge pots and I've kept them numbered. And the moment that I shifted over and had someone else make my big pots, I got a call from a major museum. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's like a very interesting thing whenever you like you you're trying so hard. Sometimes if you just like stop and let go, you know, it uh, happens. So I only have a couple more images left, but this is to say that I live a very rich life, with not very much money. This is a dinner party that I had from one of our biggest art critics, uh, Garth Clark. And um, I live, you see the little window upstairs? That's where I live. It's a very small place. Um, so when we have dinner parties, we have them outside. And we just live a very full, rich life. Um, I want to end it with. Um, I really uh, love to, to read uh, poetry, and I would love to like uh, offer this blessing. Um, I have to say that I have to go tomorrow because I have uh, 18 wheeler sitting in my pottery waiting to be loaded for the installation that goes to Santa Fe. So I'd like to leave y'all with this um, poem. This one of my favorite blessings, um, and I can't pronounce some of the words. So just you know, let me just slide through it. <laughs> on the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay that dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and country blue, come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays and the curac of thought and the stain of ocean blackens beneath you. May there come across may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of the light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you in a visible cloak to mind your life. Thanks. If you guys are in North Carolina, come see me. two and a half hours to make one, and um, uh, about three hours for them to make one of the columns or the post. Oh, yeah. And um, so, yeah. The dots, we, you know, the pots for the uh, Santa Fe, there's, there's 25,000 dots on each pot, and it takes four hours to dot one of the pots. And it's square dots, or 
They're round dots. We have a system figured out of a three and a half inch square represents 100 dots. So if we get 100 dots on a three and a half inch square, so then we can figure out the proportion of the way the dots drop in mathematically drop from each pot uh, given, you know, uh, plane out and there's a square. So these are all boring uh, quantitative questions. Let's have some qualitative questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Daniel, um, you said that what I found was very evocative. You said that uh, what has what comes out of us has come into us in some point. And um, you know, I think about a lot in my work and in terms of you also said that you know evolution only happens when we're present. So um, can you talk a little bit more about what what is the practice, or how do you keep that alive? What you have in you to constantly bring to your work every day, every moment. How do how do we get that sort of mindfulness also? But those sort of intentions and um, mm -hmm. and how do you? What kind of practices do you use to even be in the moment, present? Because you know it's hard. So I'm just well, we're in the moment, present all the time. We just don't take the luxury of enjoying it. Wow. You know? And I, it's something that I would say. So, in a way, our subconscious is in the present, doing what it does. It's just that we, are, our consciousness, isn't aware that we're doing that. So, uh, but I would go back to answering your question better, maybe to say that. Um, uh, the best way that I have learned to cope with all of this is to, to um, I've gotten really good at being scared. I've really gotten good at being able to live very afraid. And what I mean by that is that I don't let things, I don't let fear stop me. But it doesn't mean that fear will, doesn't continue to exist. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part because that's why I laid in bed for two weeks, you know. My like fear of failure was so great that I, like, I like gave myself to it. Right, but that's the thing. I think we all feel sometimes these kind of attitudes, like, where it has either fear of judgment or fear of failure. All, I mean, they're all kinds of fear, but I believe that we somehow to really access the inner space, we have to let go of that fear to really access that creative space. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's, if there's some, how do you work? Yeah, I constantly think. I constantly think. I think all the time. It's like one of the, and, and it sounds so ridiculous to say that, but people, they talk about meditation, you know, and they talk about these other things, but I think what people don't realize is how hard, how really fucking hard it is to think, and how really not many of us do it. And, I, I started to think the only way that I could leave a house that was burdened by PTSD was to think my way out of it. Mm -hmm. And I like began to learn how to think, and I like think all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because thinking is a practice, thinking is meditation, thinking is work, and people have thoughts that they don't think. And it's a big difference. And thinking is this way in which you work through things. Thinking is this objectification of our lives, of other people's lives, of our situations. And so I think for me, I think, and I learned to think, and one of the ways that I learned best to think is that apprenticeship that I got was an hour away. And I couldn't afford rent somewhere else. I had that little shack. So I had to drive an hour to work, and then I had to drive an hour home. And it gave me an hour in the morning to think, and my old radio wouldn't work, you know, which was a blessing now, I see. So I didn't have anything to like, listen to. So I had to think there, and then I had to think back. I thought about what was going to happen, and then I thought about what did happen. And it's a, it's a, it's a power, you know? Because we're really fucked up, you know? And mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it's just, it's got to be... You've got to just be okay with being scared, and you've got to be okay with, like, it, I don't really believe in happiness, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not a person that believes in happiness, or I don't seek it. Mm -hmm. um, I seek transition. Mm -hmm. I think the, like, expansiveness from one place to the other is the power. And if you want to call this place happiness, then you can, or whatever, you know, but I, I, I just, 
I just move between the two spaces. So, and what I also love about everything I'm saying now, if you listen to me next year, then it might all be different. Because it's all from a 40 year old who sort of has his head up his ass, you know? <laughs> so, uh, a, but I, I, yeah, I would like to talk to you more later, maybe, because I think I, I don't think I really answered your question, but I think I would like to hear more about what you think about it, actually. But I'll, maybe I'll move on now, but later yeah. that would be great. Thanks. Um, I think Beautiful, by the way. I, I love the architectural aspect of that photo. Um, the, uh, I, I would suspect, although it could be very wrong, that in order to um, to advance, sometimes this creative disruption might be you know, something to kind of shake up the, the juices a little bit. And I'm kind of wondering, what would what do you think would happen to you, creatively or otherwise, if you were to make a small pot? Mm. <laughs> Well, I do make small pots, um, but I think this is actually this winter, one part, like the part you don't know, I mean, there's so much you can tell me about, but the part you don't know, the reason I laid in bed for two weeks is because I stopped making small pots. And what that represents to me is a, um, about a 50% drop in income. And for me to declare to do that, it's like, I just cut my income in half. To be, I don't know how many of you make how much, but think about you signing a paper, volunteering yourself to cut your income in half because you want your work to be better. You know, it stops. That's it's because I'm blessed. I'm blessed to have fucking grown up without electricity. I don't need half my income. Yeah. Because I thought about where I came from and I don't resent it, you know. So I'm happy to, you know. Just one there, one there, and then back there. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we go here and then just follow the back. Yep. Yes. I think we'll go here right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. No, go ahead. Okay. Cool. I just want to thank you. Uh, your work, of course, speaks for itself. And I just touched by your your intuition in many ways. But I also think that you you sense that you could come come here and talk from the you know from the depths you know, to share share some some very intimate feelings about excellent work and know that you'd be embraced. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, I think that the reason why I'll speak for everyone, uh, we're so touched, is you are incredibly honest in a way that I find hard to be on in, in a real way. So I think that this would just speak be, up? I think the honesty of your presentation, your words, even if they change the next day, that doesn't invalidate. There are so many lessons we are learning from your honesty, of, um, your struggle, your work, but the nature of your work itself and your critique of the work, right? So as, as I recognize that, you know, you lay in bed, you cut it off because you were critiquing your work. You realize, you were really honest with yourself that you've gone as far as you could and you needed to go somewhere else. You didn't know where that somewhere else was. And so I think all I can say is thank you um, for sharing that. Because that must it can't be easy. It must be a blessing and a burden, right? To, to be and when you say thinking, I, I imagine that like really honestly, like you're not rationalizing anything, you're not justifying anything, you're not compromising anything, <laughs> and that's kind of incredible. And so thank you very much for that. There was one back there. Yeah, I'm really fascinated. Could you speak up, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was really fascinated about what you were talking about, like driving in the car and thinking on the way there, thinking on the way back. Um, how do you sort of, are, are you thinking in different ways, you know, when you're making work and, you know, if you are, I'm assuming you are, um, how do they inform each other, you know, like the different states of mind when you are thinking and like the different types of things you may be meditating on? Uh, you know. um. 
I try, it's really tricky. And I don't get there very often. It's the same way as meditating, you know. Like if you're on, you can meditate every day, you can do all that. But if you're really probably pretty honest with yourself, there's only like a couple times a month that it all like comes together and boom, right? Um, but uh, <laughs> most of the time you're just like sitting there, you know. Um, <laughs> so I think most of the time I'm just sitting there. But thought is fantastic. Thinking is fantastic. Having the courage to act on it is what makes it important. So stopping making small pots makes these projects important. Um, sort of. I literally went downstairs and told my princess to stop and go home. Like, I shut down the studio for a couple of days. And when they came back, they, everything about their life had changed. You know, they were making big pots all of a sudden. And I wasn't, you know. So that make, the, the actions make the thoughts have power, you know. Otherwise, the thoughts are just thoughts, you know, and they die with you. They don't, you know, they never manifest themselves into anything. So the action has to follow that. And that's, it's fine to meditate, it's fine to have thoughts, it's not fine to do all of that, but, but you know, the, the action is where it's at, you know. So that, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's, yeah. It's just that the action, it has to be followed up with some sort of action in some way, you know. And you don't, the thing about it is, is quit trying to fucking know what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> just, it's not, it's done, it's over. Like, your life is over. You're not going to, no, you're, you don't have any idea. I built a house and my partner died. It doesn't, it, everything, it's, it's, it's not going to work out. What you think is going to work out, it's not going to work out. Your boyfriend, your partner, your house that you live in now, you're not going to be there when you're 60 like you think you are. <laughs> I'll just tell you. So that, that, that sort of like idea of knowing that allows you to just, just fuck it up, you know? Just go ahead and change it if you want to. Yeah. So, yeah. When a pot breaks in the kiln, what do you do with it? It doesn't. <laughs> because that's why we're professionals. And that's the sort of interesting thing is that we, um, uh, it's really, I'm really glad you asked that question because it brings me back to the very beginning of my story and wanting to be an architect. And I decided if I wanted to be a potter, what I would do is I would study as long as a doctor or an architect would study. That I was not going to let myself off the hook. I wasn't going to quit school and let myself off the hook and study. So I studied for 10 years. And that is professionalism. So we don't break pots in the kiln. There's reasons for breaking pots in the kiln, and we don't do them. Our wood is stacked. We pull a line across the yard, and we stack the wood perfectly plumb to that line. Because that represents professionalism. When we cut wood, there's always that kind of same link. So, yeah, not to be a smart-ass, but... No, well, I just wonder because, I mean, it seems like, like when you're talking about, you know, this photo of all the pots and their full of potential, right? And mm -hmm. everything does not always go as planned. So it seems like there must always be a pot that doesn't turn out. Right? And it's like, yeah. but you still want it to kind of have this beautiful future that all the other pots have. And so I just wonder, you know, when a pot doesn't turn out like it's supposed to, what happens to it? Yeah, and we would fire our pots, so it's a lot of that happens because there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of things we don't have control over. And so those pots, what happens to those pots is um, I have a place that I put them. And then I don't make a, I don't make a commitment at that moment, and then I continue to look at them. Because a lot of times those pots teach you a lot about what you're doing. So a lot of times those pots are just bad and they get broken. And, and then sometimes those are the best pots. And sometimes they teach us. So the best thing you can do is remove yourself from them for about two or three months and allow yourself space to think about them and what happened. And so that you're not instantly judging that work. And so even having a place, and it sounds really crazy, but thinking about architecture, like I didn't have this place, but I built a space to put those pots into and it changed my whole thought process about it, because those pots then had a place to go to, and um, yeah, so that's what happens to those. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know what the most profound or special thing that clay as a material has taught you about being a potter or being a human? Well, 
Yeah, it's beautiful play. I mean, one thing that you, one reason you see um, people change when they start making pots is that clay has a reflective ability that's like none other. And um, what happens is that your personality is immediately um, reflected back to you whenever you work with clay. Because um, everything in you that you put into the pot, will, will re it just so easily reflects back to you. So if you're a person who tries to be in control, then the pot reflects that. And what it does is, if you want to get better, you're not, you, whenever you're learning to make pots, if you really want to be good at it, you're not struggling with how to make a better pot. You're struggling with how to make a better you. And that's the, that's the beauty of it, you know? Um, and it really, that reflective quality of the material, you know, it's your fingerprint that you push into it. Um, and that's the most profound thing. It doesn't let you off the hook. It's completely honest. No, it's pure. It's the right material to learn how to think about it. Mm -hmm. Because of that. Mm -hmm. It could be anything. Can I just quickly, so, we gotta okay. go. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. What, did you say who wrote that poem? Oh, John O'Donoghue. John? O'Donoghue. Thank you. Thank you. That's good, yeah. <laughs> there was one back there, okay. I appreciate what you just said. So, but where are your thoughts and not thoughts as you are shaping? You know, are Shake you centering and making a pot? You know, like, are, you, are you in the moment or are you still trying to figure out your business? You know, <laughs> you know it's, yeah. is that a place to go? Yeah, it's like, um, I would say, I would say, I would describe it the best way. The best way I would describe it is, uh, you know, uh, whenever you get these, um, I know them, I just, it's kind of embarrassing to say, but the way I know them is architectural brick or architectural shingles or whatever, they, I don't know how they, why, I've never quite understood why they call them that. But you know they're different colors, right? Oh yeah. All right, and so I've always thought about this. The way that that works is that the brick mason cannot fucking think about what he's doing while he's laying the brick. Right. If he does, it's gonna be really weird. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't, the randomness will be of a pattern. And at that level that I'm at right now, it's 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 not a thought when I'm working. It's an action. It's a it's a concentration. But it's 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 you know it's it's, it's something that happens between here and here. But it, it, it's a memory, muscle memory, you know. Yeah. Can you talk while you're doing this? I don't prefer to. You know, not really, if I'm honest. Even though that my brain might not be thinking about what I'm doing, if, if you take a bit of it away, it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, so it does allude to that, yeah. Mm -hmm. One more. Hi. Um, could you talk a little more about what you meant when you said um, that the pot has more to say about the space outside of it than the space inside of it? Oh, uh, well. Yeah. Um, I don't have a lot to say about it other than that. We don't get to be inside the jar. So unlike a house or a building to where we think about the, what it's like to be in the interior, then you have to think about what it's like to be on the exterior of this jar. So you have to think about how the relationship it has with other things around it. And so you're constantly sort of thinking about that. I, my wheel is set up at a certain height, but then I have a 40 foot walkway that I'm able to view the pot from, and I also have several steps, so I'm also able to view the pot from several different heights. So I'm constantly viewing that pot in different perspectives and different angles to understand it. And I, I look at the work upside down more than I look at it right side up. And that, so I'm thinking about that space, how it yeah impacts the space around it. And I don't I don't know a clear you know yeah. Last one, okay. Um, perhaps it's more of an observation than a question, but it has to do with the last question I was just asked. Um, so what I find interesting is that in your installations, um, it seems like you're trying to define the space that you're talking about as um, kind of a pod. So where like you're trying to define a new space within a, a pre-existing space. And I find that to be really interesting because in the two videos you showed, um, one, <coughs>
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 